Hey guys, Tyler here. Ever since Star Trek the original series premiered in 1966, the franchise has frequently depicted intelligences beyond the familiar corporeal form, that is, beyond having physical bodies. Non-corporeal beings, as they are called, may or may not have possessed a physical form at one time, but have since moved beyond it, often intersecting our reality through merely a glimmer of energy. Some of these beings have godlike abilities and can change their appearance on a whim, though many have more basic physiologies based on some form of coherent gas. Non-corporeals are a topic I've been trying to tackle on my channel for literally over two years. Non-corporeal is itself sort of a loose term that describes a wide range of beings. Recently, however, I figured out how exactly I want to approach this topic. In today's video, I'll highlight a few of the major non-corporeal species in Star Trek and discuss the implications their existence has on galactic history. I'll also examine how feasible these beings' post-physical forms are given what we know today about physics and biology. So without further ado, Let's get started. One of the most well-known non-corporeal species in Star Trek is the Organians. Despite appearing in only two episodes of the entire franchise, the Organians have nonetheless had a significant impact on interstellar affairs. First appearing in the original series episode, Errand of Mercy, the Organians broker a peace treaty between the Federation and Klingon Empire to end hostilities that have flared up in the 2260s. They at first appear as a primitive humanoid species, but shed this facade by the end of the episode, revealing that they evolved beyond physical bodies 22 million years ago. This makes the Organians possibly one of the oldest extant intelligent species in in the Milky Way galaxy, possibly second only to the Voth and the Q if they also came from the Milky Way galaxy. The Organians are described as beings of pure thought. They may be immortal, or at the very least have very long lifespans, with the last recorded death of an Organian occurring several millennia ago. They have the ability to possess the bodies of humanoids, as well as resurrect the dead, as seen in the Enterprise episode Observer Effect. They can also alter memories. As an observer race, the Organians Organians may indeed be part of a galactic community that has ascended beyond the corporeal plane. Although they appear to be less powerful than the Q, given that they're never shown traveling through time, they can generate objects like buildings for the benefit and convenience of foreign visitors. And they can alter the energy state of a system, such as disabling the weapons of Starfleet and Klingon vessels. As beings that are far more advanced than we are, it's not surprising that they are capable of manipulating matter at very tiny scales with their minds alone. This advanced combination of telepathy, mind reading, and telekinesis, moving objects with one's mind, is a superpower that relies on fundamental physics that we have never observed. Now you might be saying, well, duh, but what I mean is this. Physicist Sean Carroll has written that telekinesis would need to rely on some form of one of the four fundamental forces, electromagnetism, gravity, or the strong or weak nuclear forces, or else some fifth force that hasn't been discovered yet. Such a fifth force would have to be a billion times weaker than gravity, lest it be captured by lab instruments in experiments measuring the other fundamental forces, which has never happened. Experiments purporting to prove telekinesis have always relied on faulty methods and are filled with bias. Thus, because of this and the fact that no fifth force has ever been measured, telekinesis is largely regarded as pseudoscience. In the Star Trek universe, such powers could rely on the manipulation of the very fabric of space-time using those weird physics I alluded to earlier. The Next Generation episode, where no one has gone before, suggests that mind and matter could interact more closely when species achieve a certain level of development, allowing them to access alternate dimensions beyond the normal ones. This gets into some string theory debates that I touch on in my Mirror Universe 
science video, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already, link in the description. But speaking of development, the shedding of uh, different physical attributes over a species evolution seems to be a major aspect of their ascendancy into non-corporeality. For many species, it's evidently not an all-at-once occurrence, but a more gradual process like natural selection itself. Specifically, some of the less advanced non-corporeal life forms still seem to require some form of sustenance and often derive it through predatory means. Major examples of this include the Red Jack entity as seen in Wolf in the Fold, who is suspected to be responsible for murders attributed to Jack the Ripper, and the Beta 12A entity which is witnessed to encourage conflict between Starfleet and the Klingons. As seen in Day of the Dove. Both of these entities, as well as Gorgon from And the Children Shall Lead, the worst episode of Star Trek ever, Onaya from The Muse, also not a great episode, and the Matrix beings from Coda feed off the psionic or emotional energy of other beings, which is not too out there, given that the elicitation of fear in mammals can release certain uh, pheromones, hence why fear is often contagious. Pennywise, anyone? Play a game with me, would you? How about Street Fighter? Speaking of horror villains, the so-called Dicaronium cloud creature of Tycho 4 extracts... <laughs> extracts corse... <laughs> extracts corpuscles of iron-based blood to feed on. So, there's your space vampire. Actually, I uh, made a video about space vampires from another franchise. You should go check that out. All of this is to say that there are definitely steps that a species takes on the road from being corporeal to becoming non-corporeal. Feeding on energy may be an intermediary step, or at least is a behavior associated with some of the more animalistic non-corporeal beings that do not share the same godlike intellect as, say, the Organians, the Metrons, or the Q, or the Dowd. Remember the Dowd? Indeed, the prophets are actually rather unique in this sense, as they seem to be on the same level as the Organians and the Metrons, but they still require psionic energy from the Bajorans in the form of prayers, perhaps for stimulus or supplemental nourishment. But in any case, I haven't exactly answered how these beings would physically transition out of their bodies, nor have I discussed the logical conclusions that such an evolution process would lead to other than the vague descriptor of godhood. Suffice it to say, I think it largely has to do with technology. We have technology! Most of the non-corporeal species in Star Trek have not only evolved beyond the need for physical bodies, but have also evolved beyond the need for machines. This makes sense as a being that would be able to manipulate the fundamental forces of nature would view the machines that we're familiar with as extremely primitive. But many cosmologists believe that the most advanced alien civilizations out there in our universe would actually be cybernetic in nature, likely more advanced than, say, the providers from Gamesters of Triskelion, or even the Borg, who both still have to rely in part on organic components to function. No, these beings would be more like V'ger, living computers that have accumulated generations of knowledge. knowledge. But what does this have to do with non-corporeals? Well, in Star Trek, it's possible that a more likely evolutionary path for an intelligent species is not merging with AI, but rather evolving beyond the physical limitations of space. But while not every non-corporeal species necessarily inhabits their own alternate dimension, like the Q Continuum, many of these non-corporeal aliens have used the sum of their knowledge and experience, building increasingly sophisticated machines to bridge the gap between the material and the mystical. This is definitely the case with the Chozo in the Metroid universe, and in Trek, species like the Organians, the Metrons, the Thasians, the Q, and others likely figured out what consciousness is physically and how to separate it from their body using new physics. This is one area where I think Star Trek fundamentally diverges from the real world. We still don't know what consciousness truly is, of course, but our best efforts to measure the weight of the soul have yielded nothing. 
in Star Trek, the soul, the katra, is a distinct thing separate from the brain, a fact many scientists believe may not be true in real life. The katra is a person's life force and it can potentially be transferred from one vessel to another. Non-corporeal species have evidently figured out how to let souls travel vesselless, or even figured out how to transcend naturally from matter to pure energy, as is the case with Kess or the Zalconians. The next step after that, as evidenced with powerful beings like the Q, is to extend the abilities of said consciousness to manipulating the laws of nature. Matter energy recombination or shape shifting is one thing. Even corporeal beings like the founders, the cameloids, or the elasimorphs can do it. But physically altering reality is another. That may be the true legacy of a sufficiently advanced species in the Star Trek universe. The achievement of enough near omnipotence to create and destroy space-time at will. And if Q is to be believed, humans are perhaps on this path too. In fact, humans' prospect of becoming like the Q is a topic I explore in my video about the Q themselves. And while the Organians honestly deserve a video of their own too, I hope I did both species enough justice in this overview video about non-corporeal species. Other beings deserving of at least a mention, of course, include the infamous pesky Trelane from The Squire of Gothos, the inhabitants of the dimension-shifting planet Meridian in, well, Meridian, the body-snatching Zatarians in The Lights of Zadar, the deceitful wisps in The Crossing, the parasitic Komar in Cathexis, the harmonious Pavans in Sivis Pachum Parabellum, the cuddly companion in Metamorphosis, and of course, God, who evidently fancies starships. What does God need with a starship? Uh, and there are numerous other examples as well. Oh, and who could forget Ronan, the anaphasic life form who coerced Beverly Crusher into having intercourse with him? I also have a video about that, for better or worse. He knew exactly how I liked to be touched. The sensations were very real. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support the channel even further, becoming a patron or a member today is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. Big thanks to my top patron Sabraxis for helping helping immensely with the script for this. This is a topic that uh, Sabraxis suggested a long time ago, and I thought I, I'm going to go ahead and deliver it today. That's about all I have for this week. Live long and prosper, and may the prophets guide you well.